So the Hoftings inequality says uh, let x1 to xn be independent random variables. Where with probability 1, I will just use short, so with probability that is w dot p dot. And uh, with probability 1, that x is bounded, uh, x in some like a bounded domain. That is in AI and BI. And we let uh, Ri donate the length of the each interval. And then we have uh, for Rt greater or equal to 0, and that the probability of summation xi minus exi, that is the fluctuation of each variable, and I sum them together from 1 to n. We say this fluctuation is greater than t, and the probability of this event happen is less than something exponential to the minus 2t squared over summation i from 1 to n i squared. And in the last lecture, we kind of like say this is uh, essentially some tail bound. Tail bound in a sense, uh, we're seeing some distribution, which if we look at this summation of xi as something like S, Sn, which is i from 1 to n, this summation. And this is like the distribution of Sn. And this is the expectation of Sn, where it essentially says uh, the, the probability of it goes beyond the expectation plus t. So this is like offset. We're saying the total probability, if the random variable goes beyond the expectation plus a t, is like pretty small. It's something bounded by something exponentially small, exponential to the e to the minus t squared, something like that. Okay, so this is like tail bound, since this tail probability is very, very small. So most of the probability mass is like concentrated around the expectation. So that's why it's called concentration inequality. So today we will talk about uh, why something like this concentration is actually true. So before we're talking about that, I will also just do a slightly transformation of the theorem so that uh, to give some formula which we will frequently use in the class. So the one very easy thing to do is we can make this probability equal to delta. So we just do some change of variable. Let's say we say this delta is defined to be e to the minus 2t square over summation ri square. i from 1 to t, oh, i from 1 to n. So essentially, I'm just saying the probability is delta. When we, when we set the probability equal to delta, then we can, like, uh, we can calculate what is this t. Like We can express this t in terms of this delta. So it turns out. By doing this, we can easily solve that t is equal to something like uh, square root of summation i from 1 to n i square log 1 over delta over 2. Okay. This is just some change of, change of variable. So in this case, we can immediately get the same result, the same Hopping bound, but it's written in some slightly different way. So this is a corollary. One. We say under the same condition, As theorem one, we can say for any delta with probability at least one minus delta, we have. Uh, That summation xi minus exi, again, this fluctuation 
i from 1 to n is less than square root of uh, summation i from 1 to n ri square log 1 over delta over 2. Okay, this is essentially the same thing. So this theorem once is the probability of greater than some, some threshold is like very, very small. So this is essentially says with majority probability, that is uh, if we get rid of this like low probability events, so what's with high probability, what happens is this fluctuation will be smaller than something. And this thing is basically uh, solved by a change, change variable so that I make this probability to be delta and then ex explicitly write out what this T is. Yes. Uh, with probability one is essentially some some probability statement. You can just think with probability one essentially just says this always happen, like this is this is just a, like x i is always bounded, and with probability one minus delta is because like this is like probability event, like this is a random variable, so with some probability you know like you, you're gonna end up here, so this is like tail events. So with one minus delta is essentially what we say here, so like we get rid of this tail events. So we say with high probability that is with so essentially, we just make this probability to be delta. We're saying once one minus delta probability, we're going to be smaller than this threshold. And this threshold, we can't compute this, this, this one. OK, thank you. You're welcome. OK. So I think the benefit of doing this is a lot of times, uh, we we can just say this delta is something like extremely small, like 0 0.1 or, or 0, 0, 0 0.01 or 0 0.001, something like that. And we really want to look at the how how this fluctu summation of fluctuation like scale with n, like scale with the number of samples we have. So in this case, we can just consider a, a simple case where we can say if r1 equal to r2 equal to da, 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 equal to rn. So in this case, it's like, uh, for example, all the random variables are identically like, like sampled from the same distribution. In this kind of scenario, it, it will be much easier to see how, how those things scales. So we can roughly say this uh, r uh, summation i from 1 to n xi minus exi. This is the summation of the fluctuation. And we know if this Ri becomes R, it's just n R squared. So the entire scaling would be something like square root of n. Okay. Actually, it's like O square root of n because uh, that's all equal to. And if we consider the average This scale is one over square root of n. Okay. So why is this claim like uh, interesting or like a very strong or, or like a, it's non-trivial? So we can think. Uh, for example, we can we can write out what is this like S n like how S n how S one to to S n grows. So essentially, we have we start from so this fluctuation is something like a random work. We start from here, and then, for example, I go first here. This is like S one, S one, S one is like the summation of the fir first fluctuation, and then I go to second second summation, like I, I sum of the two fluctuation and summation of three fluctuation. So it will be something like that. This is like a random work. So what we are saying here is uh, if this is not random, like this, is, like this can be correlated or anything, then the summation of the fluctuation could be possibly something scale with n. Like for example, if everything is one, then the summation is just order n. But what we are seeing is exactly because this is like random and it's independent. So this kind of like says the fluctuation or the noise can like cancel out each other.
to a very large extent so that the summation will actually be bounded by some like square root of n curve. Like this is square root of n curve. So the growth of the, the summation of the noise is like grow as a square root of n instead of n. Okay, so this is like what we claim about the concentration. And eventually we will also say like the mean will converge, uh, like this average will converge to mean at one over square root of n rate. So that is when n go to infinity, we will actually get infinite close to the, to the, to the, to the expectation, which kind of like recovers the law of large number in that sense. Let's write this group in here. So any questions about this picture so far? OK, so if not, we will start by talking about how we prove the theorem 1. So, uh, so essentially, this uh, proof of theorem one will be the most important part of the entire concentration inequality. I think the remaining thing we won't go that extensively into the proof, and we will just briefly talking about like how to modify this proof. So this is like the uh, important thing, and this probably lasts uh, like a bit long. Like we need to do three lemmas to prove this. Okay. So first lemma is something like pretty straightforward. You probably already learned this from the probability class. That is Markov inequality. It states that let uh, x be a non-active random variable. Then, for all a greater than 0, any scalar a greater than 0, we have probability of x greater than a, greater or equal to a, less or equal to expectation of x divided by a. OK, and um, I think this is like very elementary. You probably already learned this. Uh, we'll just do a quick proof. Not much to say. This is like also a tail bound, but it's uh, much loose than this one. Like this is exponentially small, but this is just says I bounded by some, some expectation and divided, divided by A. So the proof essentially, we say note from the ex Definition of expectation. We have expectation of X is greater or equal to So essentially, we have two parts. One part is x uh, less than a. The other part is x greater than a, greater or equal to a. So what we are seeing, because the expectation essentially is the uh, integral of the like density of x times, uh, time, times x itself. So what we can do is uh, we can relax all the x in this range to be 0. Like we lower bound it by 0, because we know x is non-negative non-active random variable. Well, in this range, because all x is greater than a, so I lower bounded by a. So on both range, I'm doing lower bounds. And because we know the first term is like 0, then we kind of like cross it out. And it basically just we have the second term. That is x greater than equal to a and times a, which essentially finished this proof. Okay. 
So although this is also a tail bound, but we kind of like know this is like not very sharp. Like this is a decrease. Offset is t and decrease with e to the minus t squared. But this is offset as a, but you are kind of decrease with only one array or something like that. So we'll essentially use some techniques to make this inequality like much sharper, and eventually we getting something like that. So the remaining step will be essentially we will do two things. So the second step, we will essentially say something like uh, we'll define a new kind of random variable, which is called like sub Gaussian random variable. But like we, we we won't say too much. Basically, this is defined by some abstract condition. We will say this kind of random variable have good concentration. And then the third step, we will actually say the bounded random variable, <coughs> which essentially is the precondition of theorem one, which we say all the xi are bounded random variables. So we say bounded random variables uh, are sub Gaussians. So we will essentially do the remaining proof for splitting into two steps. Okay. So we will first uh, use some abstract condition to say, as long as the random variable satisfies some abstract condition called like sub Gaussian, and uh, we will have good concentration. And then the, the final step will be say like bounded random variable actually is a, is a class of sub Gaussian random variable. It actually satisfies this like abstract condition. So that's why like the entire thing goes through. So we will directly go to the lemma two, which talk about the, the second thing. We say let x1, xn to xm be independent random variable. in R, like any real number, we have the, this is called like a moment generating function, the expectation of uh, e to the lambda xi minus exi less or equal to e to the lambda square sigma square, sigma i square over 2. Then we have the concentration inequality that is uh, for all t greater or equal to zero. We have uh, the probability of summation i from one to n xi minus exi. Again, this summation of the fluctuation greater or equal to t is less or equal to e to the minus t square over 2 summation i from 1 to n sigma i square. So this is essentially corresponding to the first statement. And we can see the claim of this lemma essentially corresponding to what we want in a Hoffding's concentration inequality. The only difference is like this ri is different from sigma i, and uh, we have two on the top that have two like on the, at the bottom, like in the denominator. But other than this constant difference is almost the same. Okay, so essentially we will handle this difference in two and in r and sigma in, this, in the next lemma. But this lemma essentially says this already has concentration. And by sub Gaussian, we actually means uh, this condition is, is usually the definition of uh, sub Gaussian random variables. Okay. 
So in this class, because we we mostly just just need to use like bounded cons bound bounded random variables, so we won't go that deep in terms of uh, talking about why this is called sub Gaussian. But I will just give intuitive reason why this is like called sub Gaussian. This is a, I think the reason is uh, is essentially uh, for 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 the tail. So for this, if if any random variable satisfy this condition. This is like intuition. We don't we don't do proof here. If x i satisfies sub Gaussian condition, it means uh, like if you look at the distribution of this x i. And look at this tail, and it means essentially means the tail will decay. No slower than a Gaussian. So it turns out we can formally prove uh, this claim, like uh, any any variable satisfy this like this 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 inequality, we can actually prove the tail will actually decay very fast. It's like a fast equal or faster than Gaussian, um, but we won't go go to that deep like in in this class. So this is like just intuition why this is called sub Gaussian, but essentially you should know like uh, uh, like Gaussian or or bounded random variable belongs to sub Gaussian. The reason is like a tail, a Gaussian, tail of Gaussian definitely like a decay no slower than Gaussian. And uh, tail of bounded variable is very good because bounded variable essentially says like, I am only in supporting this region. I have no probability outside this region. So clearly this tail decays very fast. So that's why bounded variable is also sub Gaussian. But here, like we will just stay abstractly with this condition. Okay, L let's not go deep in terms of like uh, proving everything in that app. Yes. Uh, what are the x and y actions of the graph of the uh, little little ball? X and uh, what? Uh, y action. What are the x and y? Actions? Oh. Yeah, uh, that, that's very good. So this is like uh, n, and or maybe i, and this is uh, si. Si is like the summation of the order fluctuation up to step i, and this is like a number of step, uh, number of random variables you added. Then uh, is the horizontal line means uh, does horizontal line means the expectation of x? Uh, no, horizontal means uh, summation of xi sub subtracted the expectation. So that's why it's mean zero. Uh, okay. Yeah. So you can think this is like a, a fluctuation at a time step i. And uh, this si is just summation of the fluctuation from the first step to the, to the i step. So that's why every step I'm like doing some fluctuation, but the fluctuation is independent. So they cancel out with each other. SI, yeah. S is the su summation. Uh, okay. So I think like each time this is like a, if we talk if we say this difference is CI, then this difference is like C one and this difference is C two. So we're kinda like sum them together and so that's why it's SI. Okay. Like this is C three or something like that. Bounded lines are like my upper bounds. This is like I'm saying this will be less than less or equal to square root of n. You're saying the, the, this one, right? This is like square root of, square, square root of n line. Like li linear in n is like something like that. A square root of n in n is something like that. Okay. Is this clear? Or uh, it's still confusing. Okay, sounds good. We'll come back to this uh, again, like when we talk about. We'll later talk about another concentration inequality.
OK, so let's uh, do the proof for, for this lemma. So we start with uh, what we want to prove, that is probability of uh, summation i from 1 to n, xi minus exi, greater or equal to t. And the first thing we use is uh, this e to the lambda x is monotonic. For lambda greater than 0, So what we will do is like we just consider whatever lambda is greater or equal to zero, and we raise everything to the exponential. So we say this is equal to e to the lambda summation of fluctuation, xi minus exi, and greater or equal to e to the lambda t. So the good thing about raising to the, to the exponential is uh, now we can actually use uh, some, the Markov inequality, but we're still getting something exponentially decreased. Um, so this is the next step. We use Markov inequality. By Markov inequality, on the top is the expectation of what we, we have, that is the e to the lambda summation i from 1 to n xi minus exi. And in the denominator is what we have, that is e to the lambda t. Okay. Essentially, we just consider this whole thing as a new x, this whole thing as a new a, and we apply the Markov inequality, and we get this bound. The next step is the most important step here, and you will see the reason why we want to consider this moment generating function. And the reason is uh, we can essentially make this equal to pi i from 1 to n. That is a product of uh, i from 1 to n expectation of e to the lambda xi minus exi. I think we, we first need to say like we have expectation outside and e to the lambda t. Like the first step is we notice uh, by the exponential, we know the summation. We can put summation outside to make it a product. And the next thing we're going to use is uh, for independent x and y. We actually know this uh, exy. The expectation of x times y is equal to expectation of x times expectation of y. This is the most important property of the independence we're going to use. So that's why we can actually push this expectation inside the product, okay? just because we use the independent independence. So we can push it inside, use the independence. So once we push inside, it, it, like the entire thing becomes very easy. This like just exactly corresponds to our precondition, which is expectation of this moment generating function. We say this is upper bounded by this. Okay. So after we push it inside, we use the precondition of the sub-Gaussian random variable. We say this is less equal to e to the minus lambda t, which we copy from the denominator, and then plus uh, 
lambda square summation sigma i square i for a uh, sigma i square i from one to n over two. This is like e to the to the everything. Okay. Everything is on the exponent. This is like pretty straightforward. It's just so we plug in the precondition of sub Gaussian random variable. So we start from what we want, and we already reach here. The only thing we need to do is uh, now we still have additional lambda here. And, but the good thing is that we can, we can make lambda to be anything. So that's why the final step is we just optimize over lambda, and then, then we can get the tightest bound we want. So to optimize over lambda, it's, uh, it's relatively straightforward. I won't go into details, because this is like a second order polynomial. And we all know how to optimize over second order polynomial. So it turns out uh, we can pick optimal lambda. That is equal to t over summation of sigma i square i from 1 to n, which uh, corresponding to the lambda, that will minimize this uh, probability. So that we will have this uh, p of uh, i from 1 to n xi minus e xi greater or equal to t is less or equal to e to the minus lambda star t and the plus lambda star square summation i from 1 to n sigma i square over 2, and which you plug in and calculate out, and it's exactly equal to e to the minus t square over 2 summation sigma i square. OK, and this finishes the proof. So, so you, now you have more idea of why we, we want to make some precondition like that and uh, like call this like sub Gaussian. And it's, it's exactly because uh, we want to use independence. And one way very easily use independence is like raise this summation to the exponent so that we can make this summation to become a product. And once we have the product structure, we can use the independence. And then everything just follows through. So that's why it's naturally just uh, to assume something expectation of, of the X, uh, of this uh, x in the exponent, and we just make this sub sub Gaussian. Okay. So the final step is the lemma three, as we will say, like we we kind of assume this abstract condition, and then we need to still to verify that uh, bounded random variable actually satisfies this abstract condition. This is what we will say here. We say if x is a random variable. Where x is in a range of a to b with probability 1. And r equal to b minus a 
is the range, the length, the length of the interval. And then we have uh, the expectation of e to the lambda x minus e x. Essentially, this is like a moment generating function. We say this is less or equal to e to the lambda square r square over 8 for any lambda in r. This is uh, our third claim that bounded random variable actually satisfied the abstract condition, which we call it sub Gaussian, with, uh, with precisely this uh, sigma i is equal to like r over 2, something like that. Any questions so far? Or if you have any questions about any step of derivation, like you're never unclear, you're not very clear, I can, I can explain again. So the final lemma is, uh, is uh, would be rel relatively straightforward. It's, it's about single random variable. So there's not really much about the like cancellation noise going on. It's just essentially by brute force com computation. Because this is just a single random variable, and you want to prove some, some expectation is uh, less than some, some quantity. OK. So we will just do the calculation. That, uh, so for convenience and notation simplicity, that we define z is equal to the mean 0 version of x. Okay. So we define z equal to x minus ex. So we also define a function, lambda, phi lambda, psi lambda. Is that uh, psi lambda is equal to the log of expectation e to the power of uh, lambda x minus e x. Which is equal to like log e to the lambda z. Okay. Essentially, this is a moment generating function, but we take a log outside. So it's a log moment generating function. So we can use the Taylor theorem or like Taylor expansion. We say this Poisson lambda is equal to Poisson zero plus Poisson prime zero lambda Poisson prime zero. And plus the second order approximation, we sec like Taylor, Taylor expansion with second order remainder is lambda square over 2 times the second order derivative of psi. And the only difference is now it's not, no longer evaluated 0, but evaluated lambda prime. So that lambda prime is something like in 0 and lambda, some, some intermediate point. So we note uh, this, uh, what we want to bound essentially is uh, 
like this Psi is just the log of objective. So as long as we can have some upper bound on Psi, we already like finished the lemma. So this is a, what are we going to do next? Essentially, we want to bound this Psi, Psi lambda. So to use this theorem, we need to calculate what is like uh, the gradient and uh, the second order derivative of this Psi. So I will just do the uh, calculation for you. And uh, we start from Psi of this, and you take derivative o over lambda. And you can actually do the calculation, which you see the gradient is equal to the expectation of e to the lambda z times z. Over e to the lambda z. This is the gradient, and this is second order derivative. This is equal to expectation of e to the lambda z divided by expectation of e to the lambda z, z square, subtracted by expectation of e to the lambda z. Subtracted by this is like a for front and subtracted by e to the lambda z over expectation of e to the lambda z z this entire thing square. So the reason we want to do this Taylor expansion is because first we immediately notice this Psi is zero. It's just so we plug in lambda equal to zero, which uh, e to the zero is like one. So log one is zero. So Psi zero is equal to zero. So the first term is gone. And then the second term, Psi prime zero, is also again, we put lambda equal to zero here and this become one, this become one. It's just equal to expectation of z. And we know that this z is defined to be mean 0. z is defined to be x minus e to the x. So this is, again, equal to 0. So all we need to bound is the third term, that is uh, the second order derivative of this Psi. So in order to bound the second der order derivative of Psi, we need to look at uh, those terms, like those seemingly very complicated terms. But let's, for example, look at this term. Okay, let's call this term star. So in, in the sense of, uh, let's say, if, if it's a continuous random variable, so we say star is actually equal to the integral of we have the density function of z times e to the lambda z and divided by, again, the integral of the density z and e to the lambda z dz. And we have additional z here, so we times z dz. So one very smart observation is we can actually bundle those things together. We make this thing a new density, like a p tilde z. So we know p tilde is also a density function.
probability density. Because uh, two things. The, in order to check his probability, we only need to check two things. One is uh, p tilde z is greater than 0, greater or equal to 0 for any z. This is like obviously true, because we, it's, it's density times something non-active. So this is always true. And the second thing, we need this, uh, like we need to do this, do this integral over the density, and that's going to summation equal to 1. And this is also very straightforward, because we can, if we define this as a p tilde, and then when we do the integra integration, we essentially just integrating the numerator part. And eventually, that's exactly equal to the denominator. And so that's equal to 1. So this essentially means uh, this p, this uh, lambda double prime, uh, this uh, second order derivative of uh, psi is actually equal to the expectation. Like you can also do the similar trick for the first term. And it becomes some new expectation of uh, z, z squared divided by expectation of z squared. This expectation is, uh, is taking expectation under new distribution. P tilde. And uh, this just becomes the, you know, this is like the variance now. This is just uh, equal to e tilde, z minus e tilde square. Okay. Um, this, I think, is pretty elementary. You can expand it out, and then, then this is equal to this. So now the good thing about uh, this is uh, we know this is just expectation of something bounded. Because z is bounded, expectation of z is bounded. So this uh, difference is also bounded. So we know very straightforwardly, because z is uh, in some range that is uh, like uh, we, 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 at most r. So z minus ez is at most r. So the one obvious upper bound is like r squared. But you can actually, by careful analysis, you can actually do better. You can actually do a tighter bound. Which uh, we will actually say this is uh, less or equal to r squared over 4. So we can get a constant improvement. So for most of this class, constant doesn't matter. So we'll actually leave this to homework. So we're more or less done. Uh, so just to recap what we have been doing so far, we essentially says we start from the Poisson lambda, and we do a Taylor expansion, and the first term is 0, second term is 0, and third term we kind of already get the upper bounds. 
So we say this is upper bounded by lambda square divided by two, uh, divided by two times r square divided by four, which is uh, lambda square r square over eight. Okay. And uh, we note this uh, psi lambda is exactly the log of what we want to upper bound. So if essentially we just take exponential on both sides and we finish the proof. Yes. Uh, any questions? Oh, wait, that comes from that term. What happens to the side plan zero again? Oh, wait, oh, it's uh, yeah, it's, it's equal to zero, yeah. Why is x position of z equal to zero again? Oh, because uh, we define z to be the mean zero version of x. Yes. So, uh, so every field by expectation is uh, calculated with the p. p tilde. P tilde, yeah. P tilde. Yes. Oh. Yes. Yes. I think this step essentially we just change the distribution from P to P tilde. Yes. Uh, what's the general intuition or reason why we are calculating or proving all these lemmas? Uh, I think the reason is, as I said, uh, I think the third one is like a bit about brute force calculation. And we can see from the second lemma, looking at some moment generating function is like very natural when we're handling this uh, summation of independent random variables, uh, right? Because uh, I think last time I wrote here, like uh, we essentially, to use independent uh, property, we need, to, we, we need to look at the product of, of a random variable instead of a summation of random variable, summation of independent random variable, right? So it's very natural to raise it to the exponent, so the summation become the product. So that's why from the second lemma, it's pretty easy to see why we care about some quantity like that. that. So the third one is essentially the bridge, essentially says, uh, I want to prove uh, the bounding random variable actually satisfies something like this, so that we, we finish the Hoffman quote. Of this is just two proof hopping. Yeah, that's good. So eventually, I think the I don't need to say too much about the proof of hopping inequality. We're essentially preparing our lemma to to prove the hopping inequality. Essentially, just the lemma two plus lemma three. Like lemma two says sub Gaussian random variable has concentration, and lemma three says bounding random variable are sub Gaussian. So that's clear, bounding random variable also have concentration, and that's finished the proof. Okay. Uh, in case you feel like this proof is like pretty complicated and or or you cannot very really follow it's uh, it's okay, like you can go back to take a look. And on the other hand, like uh, when we continue the lecture, we don't really, really need this uh, proof. Uh, like uh, all we need is we want to use the Hoffman's inequality. So, so like the theorem statement and the corollary is the most important part. Like we would repeatedly use it when we're doing the learning scenario. And this is just to back up why some concentration inequality like, like, like that is true. So, yes. Uh, sorry, could you say again? 
The second, uh, uh, second lemma is uh, what? what? Uh, third lemma. Third, third, third lemma. The function. Psi. Psi. Yeah. 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 Convex. The function psi is convex. Because psi is not kind of lambda. If you always factor it with the zero. Second order derivative is always greater or equal to zero. That, that is true, yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's a good comment, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yes, I think, uh, so the question is uh, why the first two terms are at zero and third term is at some intermediate point. I think this is, uh, this is essentially the, in the calculus, uh, when you do the Taylor expansion, typically you need to expand to the infinite order, right? It's not like you, you truncate at a second order, you need to have third order, fourth order, and something like that, then you can expand it at zero. So what we use here is we don't want to like uh, do the calculation for the third order, fourth order, that's like too much. So we use a second order remainder version of Taylor. It's saying like you, if you truncate at a second order and you don't look at a third order, then the last, last term is no longer centered at zero, but centered at some intermediate point of zero and blah, 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 blah. it can be oh, anything. Yeah. 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 Okay, so if no further question about Hofding's inequality, we will just uh, briefly talk about the second concentration inequality and we'll finish the random variable part, uh, independent random variable part. So the theorem two is so-called Bernstein's inequality. So this is still a, a independent random variable, but uh, uh, I think in sometimes in the lecture and homework we will use this inequality because this inequality in some scenario is actually tighter than Hofding's inequality. So let uh, again let x i be independent random variable. And with probability one, we have, uh, again, it's bounded. Let's just say this, uh, this difference is bounded by R. Let's not care about the constants. And uh, I think the only difference is uh, in the Bernstein inequality, we have uh, one additional condition, which can be stronger. We actually say it's the variance of each xi is bounded by sigma i squared. Then for RT greater than zero, we again have the concentration inequality. That is the probability of the summation of the fluctuation xi minus exi greater or equal to t is less or equal to e to the minus t square, two times the summation of i from one to n, sigma i square, plus uh, two over three rt. So we will no longer do the proof of Bernstein inequality, it's a little bit involved. But uh, I think this class just uh, only requires you to, to be able to use this kind of uh, concentration inequality. So we can think this is like a slightly stronger condition, which says it's not only a random variable with bounded radius r, but it also has some variance bound sigma i. And potentially, the Bernstein will be much sharper if this sigma i is much smaller than this r. Okay. In that case, we'll have concentration inequality which basically everything is same except that the denominator is slightly modified. So it will be e much easier to see what is the more modification in the other term. So we can, we can again make this uh, 
to be lambda, uh, to be delta. So the Bernstein inequality is again equivalent to with probability at least uh, one minus delta. We will have the following, that is uh, summation i from one to n xi minus exi is less or equal to some constant c times uh, summation sigma i square i from one to n log one over delta plus r times uh, log one over delta. Okay. Again, this is just some change of uh, variables. You can, you can make this lambda and you can express t in terms of, uh, you can express this in terms, you can express t in terms of delta and you will get this bound. This is a Bernstein concentration in quality. This is Bernstein. And if you still remember the Hoffding's concentration inequality tells you everything is the same, but the Hoffding's inequality on the right hand side is something like this something like summation of uh, i from 1 to n ri square log 1 over delta. Yes? C is just some, yeah, some, some constant like 10 or something, absolute constant. Yeah, I think a lot of times we don't really care about the exact constant, so we will just look at how, how everything scale with n, how everything is. So we can already see the, the major term of those two things. I accept this like a low order term. The major term is this term and this term, because this term will grow with square root of n. This is like summation of one to n, so this is like something scale with n. So when we take square root, this is square root of n. And this is also square root of n term. So we will see the Brinston square root of n term actually only scale with the variance. Well, the Hoffding's like a square root of n term scale with the entire bound. So when the variance is much smaller than the, the, the bound, the Bernstein will be sharper. Okay. So we can take a look at uh, one example, quick, quick look at one example. Example is like unfair coin toss. So we just say for each xi, it's sampled from Bernoulli p. That is the width probability of p, which essentially says uh, that's equal to one with probability p. And uh, equal to zero with probability one minus p. So in this case, uh, we can see the, the, the bound on x, like uh, x, x is bounded, but the range radius is r is equal to one. But we can also compute the expectation and the variance. So the expectation is only equal to p, and the, the variance of x is equal to something p times one minus p, and it's upper bounded by p. We can also say it's upper bounded by p. So in this case, in Hoffding's inequality, we can only say something like one, o one over square root of n, uh, one over n average. The difference between average and its expectation it's upper bounded 
by this term divided by n, because this is like a summation of the fluctuation. What we look at there is the average fluctuation. So everything is divided by n. And we plug in this r equal to 1. So what we get is something like c times uh, log 1 over delta over n. This is what we get from Hoffman's inequality. But by Bernstein inequality, we can actually plug in the variance is equal to p here. Okay. And we just divide it by everything by n. So we actually get something like 1 over n summation i from 1 to n xi subtract by p is less or equal to c times uh, square root of uh, p times uh, log 1 over delta over n plus log 1 over delta over n. We know the second term is the lower order term. Well, the first term is the leading order term. And we, if we compare the leading order term of the two concentration inequality, we notice the Bernstein inequality has additional p there. So this kind of concludes that uh, if uh, p much less than 1, then Bernstein inequality is a lot better than, than Hofding. Okay, any question about the statement of Bernstein inequality or this uh, comparison? Okay. So if not, I think finally I want to talk a little bit more about uh, um, another extension, like not only being sharper, but like how we're going to relax the independent condition. So this is what we're going to use uh, eventually in a reinforcement learning setting. That is uh, concentration inequality. For Martingo difference, or for Martingo. So. Don't be scared by the words, and eventually you will feel this concept is like pretty intuitive, and uh, the concentration inequality we derived for Martingo will be almost identical to the concentration inequality we get from independence. So you can think this is like a generalization of independence. So we'll first talk about the intuition of what kind of thing is like a martingo and why and something is not, not, not like independent but martingo. So I think intuition about martingo is, for example, we have like kasi 1, kasi 2, kasi da da da, kasi n. 
So independent really just says the randomness here and the randomness here is, uh, is like a completely independent. They, 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 they are not correlated. Well, this kind of concentration is like a lot easier, but uh, a lot of times in, in like sequential decision making and reinforcement learning, this is like is a really a luxury. I think a lot of times it doesn't hold. So that's why we, 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 like a, we want something like generalization of independence. We want something weaker than independence so that it holds in the de sequential decision making but somehow still have good concentration. So intuitively, so Martin goal is, uh, is something like if we want to look at, again, summation of uh, this uh, KCI, and uh, KCI, the, the, the each KCI that is no longer independent, but we have something like, uh, we have some condition like this. That is the expectation of KCI conditioned on everything in the past. So this is a little bit abstract, but you can think of one very easy scenario of the past is basically just uh, KCI minus one till KCI one. So this is everything happened in the past. So we're saying conditional on everything in the past, like for example, this may equal to one, this equal to minus one, this equal to something else. Like whatever condition on this, and I have this equal to zero. Then we will call epsilon i. Then this, this epsilon i is called, like this, this sequence of epsilon i, is called a Martin Gold difference sequence. So we will come to the like a rigorous definition later, but this is I want to first talk about the intuitive understanding of what is like Martingo. Martingo essentially is uh, saying I no longer care about whether each XCI is independent, but I care about when I condition on what happened in the past, my new randomness KCI is mean zero. Okay, this is very important to me. So let's look at an example to see what is the difference between independence of this and this like Martin Go kind of thing. So for example, we can look at uh, uh, like a, a sequence of length two, like n equal to two, which is like to showcase what is the difference. So let's say we have a two, in the length two case, we have like two random variable that is Kc1 and Kc2. So let's see, KC1 takes two value, that is minus one and one. And KC2 takes three value, that is minus one, zero, and one. So the joint probability, or maybe not, let's not talk about joint probability, let's talk about the conditional probability of P KC2 conditional on KC1. This is the table for conditional probability, that is, uh, 0 0.5, 0, 0 0.5, and 0, 1, 0. Okay. So we clearly know this uh, P KC2 condition on KC1 equal to 1 is not equal to P KC2 condition on KC1 equal to minus 1. Because one distribution is 0 0.5, 0, 0 0.5, the other distribution is 0, 1, 0. So this clearly says KC1 uh, is not independent of KC2. Okay, because condition on different uh, value of KC1, my distribution of KC2 actually can be different. So they are not no longer independent. But the good thing about uh, that is uh, we can look at expectation of KC2 condition on KC1 equal to one. And we can also look at expectation of KC2 condition on KC1 equal to minus one. If you look at both of them, they are equal to zero. This is essentially corresponding to this equation that says uh, if we look at expectation of KC2, 
no matter what happens in the past, this is equal to zero, which corresponds to this exactly this two equality. So this somehow says uh, this uh, Cassie one and Cassie two is actually a Martin Gold difference sequence. So in the previous uh, picture of concentration, like in the independent variable case, let's say, for example, if we look at the summation of uh, i from 1 to n, cosi, i, and those are independent. And let's say the the expectation of CCI is equal to zero. Let's just say this is like a mean, mean zero random variable and it's independent. We already have the picture that essentially, if we track the summation, it becomes a random word. So first step, we're going to go up by C one And the second step, we're going to probably go down or go up by C two And then third step, we're going to go up or go down by C three And then fourth step, we'll go by C four and, but we will see, because they're independent, so a lot of noise is going to cancel out and eventually just become some random work. And we say the concentration in quality kind of exists. This random work, if you look at the summation, is like bounded by square root of n with high probability. So what are we going to say in the multiple concentration inequality is uh, we actually no longer need this independence. We can replace this independence by Martingale difference. To be Martingo. The only difference about this independence and Martingo is uh, now, for example, one trajectory is look like this, and we end up here. This is like a CT, a CN. So, for example, CT. And some other trajectory like goes up here, and then we end up here. This is like CT. This is like second trajectory. So, what we are seeing now, they are not independent because uh, this distribution can be different from this distribution. Like in this case, this can be like 0 0.5 equal to 1, 0 0.5 equal to minus 1, and this can be with probability 1 equal to 0. So the distribution actually depends on the past history. But the most important thing is the expectation of the new random noise condition on the past is always equal to 0. And as long as this multiple like condition is actually holds, we can also get the concentration inequality. OK? And this is what we will actually see in the next lecture. Yes, question. I was just wondering um, if when the first homework will be posted. Homework, uh, first homework will be posted by next Monday or Tuesday, yeah, early next week. OK, and that's, this ends the lecture today.